Happy Fourth of July to everyone. Before we begin the sermon today, I want to encourage you to get the latest Palm City Presbyterian Church newsletter because I've written an article called What Can We Do for America? You can get a copy of this at the church or you can find it on our website. Just go to the resources tab and look for newsletter. It addresses a lot of what's going on in our country today and I try to provide a, some practical and helpful ways that we can be a blessing to our country in this difficult time. Now, let us hear God's word to us today. It comes from Micah chapter 6. Hear the word of the Lord. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old, Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O oh man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice, and to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Reading scripture out of context can be dangerous. An athlete takes the field with Philippians 4.13 written on her arm. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. When Paul wrote that, he meant that Christ gave him the strength to persevere in his ministry. Even when he faced hardship and a lack of resources. It has nothing to do with scoring a goal or running over a defender. What happens if she loses the game? Did Christ fail her? I've seen Jeremiah 29 11 written on checkbook covers. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. That's a promise that God will establish his people. I suppose it could be interpreted more broadly to describe God's care for each of his children. But it's certainly not a promise that you're going to get rich. Yet many people take it that way. So... What happens if you're poor? Did God's promise fail? Probably the most misused verse in the Bible is Matthew 7, 1. Judge not that you be not judged. Jesus said that to warn us against a harsh judgmental attitude because we all need grace. He didn't mean that there is no such thing as right and wrong. But a lot of people today hold up that verse and hide behind it as if it were diplomatic immunity. No one can question me. No one can criticize my behavior. Some of them will even say, only God can judge me. That thought ought to terrify them. The climax of our scripture reading today, Micah 6, 8, is also a verse that is frequently taken out of context and misunderstood. He has told you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Some people hear that and take it to mean that behavior is all God really cares about. They think if you're a nice person, a so-called good person, then God is going to be happy with you. And all this doctrine and religion are just a waste of time. Who needs baptism? Who needs worship? Who needs essential tenets? Because all God cares is that you're fair to people and honest. That's what religion boils down to in the end, right? That's what they say, but they're wrong. 
They're wrong because they misunderstand this verse and they misunderstand it because they take it out of context. And by lifting it out of context, they miss the most important thing. Covenant. These words are spoken within the context of the covenant relationship between God and his people. Last week, we heard that God bound himself to his people by a covenant. A covenant is a relationship of promise. He made a covenant with them, and he was faithful to them, even when they were not faithful to him. In Micah chapter 6, God basically says, I've been faithful as your God. Why haven't you been faithful as my people? In our scripture reading today, God's people say, okay, we understand that you're upset. What do you want from us? And verse 8 is God's response. It assumes that covenant relationship is there. So let's read our passage in its proper context, and we will see that A, your right behavior grows out of your relationship with God. It's not a substitute for it. And B, God has a very challenging message for us today. So in verses 1 through 5, God brought a lawsuit against his people. He was not happy with them. Why not? As we heard last week when I preached on this, those verses, honest people were being cheated out of their ancestral land, Judges were corrupt, prophets were greedy, priests were lazy, and nearly everyone worshipped idols. They had stopped listening to God's word. They had stopped obeying God. These were supposed to be God's people. But who could tell the difference between them and any of the pagan nations that lived around them? As I also explained last week, they suffered from a theological condition known as small god-itis. This is what happens when your understanding of God becomes so small that you think of God as a human being who has a lot of power. This happens when we fail to listen to God's word. It is accelerated when we live by the world's values. First, truth begins to seem less plausible. Then it's less clear. And in the end, you end up with a caricature of the living God instead of real knowledge of him. In the case of God's people in Micah's day, it caused them to imagine that God was just like one of their corrupt officials. Back then, if you got in trouble, or if you wanted to do something that wasn't strictly legal, all you had to do was bribe the right person. Getting your way was simply a question of how much were you willing to pay. In last week's passage, God brought that lawsuit against his people. This was a literary device Micah used to express his message in a creative way. Micah was very creative. He spoke in a memorable way, so he he frames his message as a lawsuit God brings against his people. And in our scripture reading today, that lawsuit, that conversation continues. So God's people say, okay, we get it. You're angry. You're upset. You have a right to be. And rather than respond to God as they should have, they responded to God the way they would respond to one of their corrupt judges or officials. They treated his lawsuit, they would have treated any other lawsuit. They didn't try to argue their case or counterattack God's arguments. Instead, they whipped out their wallet. It's bribe time. Okay, God, you've got a point, so what do you want? Don't worry, we're going to make this right. Tell us, what do you want? How much is this going to cost us? If you look at verses 6 and 7, you'll see that the price keeps going up. It starts out, 
with what shall I come before the Lord? And how will I present myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings? Burnt offerings seem like a good place to start because the law of Moses prescribed burnt offerings to atone for sin. Not because burnt offerings really atoned for sin, but the burnt offerings were a symbol of a person's repentance. And in a mysterious way, they pointed toward the cross of Christ. So the law said, bring a burnt offering. Maybe that was what they needed to do. But what if a burnt offering wasn't enough? Micah continues, with calves a year old. Yearling calves were the choicest offerings prescribed in the law of Moses. Maybe God wanted the best. But then again, maybe it wasn't quality God was looking for. Perhaps it was quantity. Micah says, will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Thousands of rams is a lot of rams. And ten thousands of rivers of oil is clearly impossible. But is that what God wanted? Are God's demands so unreasonable? Micah wasn't finished. Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? This is heavily ironic. To even suggest it was to insult God, because in the law, God absolutely forbade any form of human sacrifice. He said it was an abomination. God's people were never to do that. And yet King Ahaz did that. He offered some of his own children as sacrifices to pagan idols. What Ahaz thought was the pinnacle of devotion, God utterly rejected. So their attempt to bribe God failed. Even if they had 10,000 rivers of oil, it wouldn't be enough. Even if they gave what was most precious to them, it still was not enough. Well, okay then. So God, what is it that you want? And he gives us the answer. He has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. When Micah uses the word man, he clearly means it in the old-fashioned way that includes both men and women. And again, remember that these words are spoken within the context of the covenant. These people know God, or at least they should. They have experienced his grace. They are his people. They know that they are his people. So they have this relationship, this foundation. So given this foundation, this covenant with God that they have, how does God expect them to live? Now, I would add that God expects everyone to live this way, whether they are believers or not. But you need to understand that this lifestyle without the relationship does not do you any good. Now, Micah assumes that covenant relationship. He takes that for granted. We can't afford to do that. God wants you to have both a covenant relationship with him, which you have through Jesus Christ, and to live this way. And if your relationship with Christ is genuine, God's grace is going to change you, and you're going to have the lifestyle. You really can't have the relationship without the lifestyle. You could have the lifestyle without the relationship, but again, it's not going to do you any good. You need both. Let's consider now 
what exactly God wants from us. Micah says God expects us to do justice. At first, that seems fairly simple. Treat people honestly and fairly, right? Justice, however, proves to be a tricky concept. Everyone today is calling for justice. But whose justice? Some people think justice is served when a criminal is locked up. Others say justice has not been achieved until the social conditions that push that person toward crime have been addressed. Some people say justice means a fair playing field, a level playing field. Others say that justice requires us to advantage those who have historically been disadvantaged. Everyone loves justice, but when you listen to what people are saying, you realize they're not always talking about the same thing. So, who's justice? Obviously, God's justice. But what is God's understanding of justice? I don't have time to give you a full exposition of the concept of justice in the Bible. That would be a book, a really long book. But I can give you a nutshell. God's understanding of justice basically has two parts. The first part is you give people what they deserve. Everyone gets what is due to him or her. This means you treat people honestly and fairly. People get what they deserve. There is another part to God's justice, and the second part of God's justice is compassion for the weak and vulnerable, caring for those in need. I think I can illustrate this with Job. You recall that Job suffered tremendously, and he claimed that he didn't deserve the suffering that he got. And we, the readers of the book of Job, know that that's true. We know more of the story, and we know that Job is not being punished for anything he did. In chapter 29, Job argues that he's always tried to live the right way. I want you to listen carefully to what he says. He says, I delivered the poor who cried for help and the fatherless who had none to help him. The blessing of him who was about to perish came upon me and I caused the widow's heart to sing for joy. I put on righteousness and it clothed me. My justice was like a robe and a turban. I was eyes to the blind and feet to the lame. I was a father to the needy, and I searched out the cause of him whom I did not know. I broke the fangs of the unrighteous and made him drop his prey from his teeth. Job says he put on righteousness and that his justice was like a turban and a robe. When he describes that in literal language, what it means is he showed concern for the vulnerable and the needy, the widow, the orphan, the blind, those who were helpless. He was a help to them. He showed compassion to his neighbor. Biblical justice demands more than just being honest and fair to other people. It means that each person gets what they deserve, but it also means more than that. It means concern for your neighbor. In the Bible, justice is a very broad concept. Well, next, Micah tells us that God wants us to love kindness. Actually, there's some debate over the best way to translate this. And if you look at the ESV, there's a footnote that suggests an alternate translation, steadfast love. God wants us to show steadfast love. 
This is language that comes from international treaties in the ancient Near East. Back then, kings would make treaties or covenants with each other, and they would promise to show steadfast love. Basically, they would promise to be loyal to each other. And God wants us to be loyal to him. This means that God wants you to make an emotional and spiritual commitment to him. He wants you to show steadfast love toward him the way he shows steadfast love toward you. The traditional translation, love kindness, is more familiar, and certainly God wants us to be kind to one another. But I do think there's more going on here because this language comes straight out of those covenants that were made in ancient times. Finally, we are to walk humbly with our God. This means we acknowledge that God is God and we are not. We don't try to decide what is right and wrong. God does that. We don't try to impose our will on others. We seek God's will. So do justice, love kindness, or show steadfast love, and walk humbly with God. This is what God wants from us. And once again, covenant is key. Because how do we know what this looks like? Well, we learn it from watching what God does. How do we know how we should treat God, how we should treat our neighbor? We learn that by experiencing how God treats us. God's people back in Micah's day could look back to the Exodus. We talked about that last week. How God showed grace to them, how he cared for them, how he was faithful to them, even when they were not faithful to him. We can look back on all of that Plus more, we can look back and see the cross of Jesus that he gave himself for us. And when we remember how much God loves us and with what costly love he bought us for himself, then we will understand that we cannot simply grab whatever we can in life and be indifferent to other people. That's how the world works, but Christians can't be like that. We can't just take whatever we can get for ourselves and not care about others. God's grace closes that avenue to us. We have to live a different way. So Micah teaches us two things, or rather through the book of Micah, God today is telling us two things. Number one, God wants your heart, mind, and soul. Nothing less will do. You can't bargain with God. You can't bribe God. You can't say, okay, Lord, what's it going to be? An hour on Sunday morning? A little Bible reading and prayer? Tithing? What do you want? God says, you're coming at this the wrong way. I want you, all of you. And if you give me that, then all this other stuff is going to fall into place. And second, your relationship with God changes how you live. Once you experience his grace, you're not your own anymore. You can't just live however you want. You're going to want to be more like him. And specifically, you're going to want to do justice, show steadfast love, and walk humbly with God. So covenant and lifestyle. A relationship with God through Jesus Christ that makes you Christ-like. That's what God expects from you. And that 
is also God's gift to you.